to our advisory board. So with that, let me transition to the message. Um, I have experienced this week a ton of battle when it comes to working on the sermon and prep. Uh, battle actually started last weekend during the message, interestingly enough, and just has continued on a number of fronts. Um, we live in a spiritual battle zone, and just like crazy stuff, like truly during the night. So please, if you're an intercessor, please be praying for me. As I'm preaching at the first service, I just start to feel like this tension out of nowhere in my lower back, just like, ah, there's a spiritual battle. And then out of nowhere, like as I'm preaching, it's like all of a sudden my mouth just starts getting really, really dry and it's just kind of getting my head. And so there's a battle, there's a battle. And so uh, the battle for this message has been going on. I've been sending out text messages, prayer requests. If you're an intercessor, please be praying for me right now as I, as I preach. I, I do not believe there's any coincidence that this, this sermon is called Overcomer. And sometimes we just have to, we just have to show up and we battle through what, what, whatever's coming our way. So let's see what God does. Let's see what God does. Thanks for the worship team. Thanks to Austin for making me cry during worship. It's a good thing. Hey, so we launched a series called Living Like Orphans in God's House. This series is about our identity and about how God wants us to believe who he says we are. And this is true all ages. God wants you to believe who he says you are. How he sees you. The sermon is about lies and overcoming lies. Lies that we believe. Lies that derail us. Lies that we often choose to define us. Lies that often attack us at the weak points in our armor. The chinks in our armor. Many, many times... God says one thing about us, but the world says another thing about us. And we choose what the world says. We choose to believe that. God says one thing about us. People say another thing. And we oftentimes, unfortunately, choose to believe what people say. God says one thing about us. And then we tend to think things about ourselves. And believe it or not, we tend to think we're right instead of what God says. Like, God, you really don't know me. Really? <laughs> and we laugh, but it's, it's a sad truth. We often choose to believe what the world says or other people say or the deepest, darkest version of ourselves as opposed to what God says. So we need to become overcomers and overcome those lies. And to do that, I'm going to teach one of the most famous teachings, arguably, from Jesus. A story often called the parable of the prodigal son, Luke 15. Now, as a kid growing up, Catholic church, I thought I knew everything there was to know about this story. Until I read two books. One of them was by Randy Clark called Out of the Bunkhouse, and then Tim Keller, the prodigal God. So even if you've heard this story before, you're familiar with it, I'm going to throw a couple plot twists your way. Plot twists that were inspired by these two authors that will cause you to look at this super familiar parable in a whole new way. So we're going to be again in Luke 15. Here's how this begins. Jesus continued. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. So this younger son asks his dad for an inheritance, his inheritance, which in the Jewish culture would be like saying, Dad, I wish you were dead. But in the amazing grace of this father, the dad grants the request. So instead of living in his father's house, the younger son basically says, Dad, you're dead to me. Which, by the way, is what the devil basically said 
to God the Father when he chose to rebel. That's what I preached on last week, the original orphan spirit. So even though his dad is still alive, the younger son chooses to live like an orphan. Verse 13. Not long after that, the younger son got, to, got together all he had, set off to a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. Now, I'm a child of the 80s. And so when I read this verse, the song lyric that comes to my mind is basically what the younger son did was he said, tonight I'm going to party like it's 1999. And if you are like a child or a teen or in your 20s, you have no idea what I just said. And it's crazy to think about like for a long time, talking about 1999 seemed like so far in the future. And now the song is like 25 years old. It's crazy. <laughs> but this son took everything his father gave him and wasted all of it. It continues, so he went and he hired himself out to a citizen of that country. Again, this is a Jew, and he hires himself out to a Gentile. It says, and this guy sent him to, field, to, to the fields to feed pigs. He had longed to fill his stomach with the pods the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. So this is like the ultimate insult, the lowest of lows as a Jewish person to work in a pig pen, eating pig food. Verse 17, when he came to his senses, and by the way, thankfully, he came to his senses. He said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So again, he comes to his senses. Thankfully, he wants to go back home. Thinks that he blew it and cannot be redeemed. Thinks what he did cannot be overcome, cannot be undone. Thinks he can be no longer called a son again. But he thinks maybe his dad will have enough mercy to make him a hired servant. At least then he'd have a roof over his head, some food in his stomach that wasn't pig food. He wouldn't live in the father's mansion, but at least he would be able to live in the bunkhouse, the servant's quarters. He wouldn't be in a real relationship with his father. He'd no longer be a son. He'd be a servant, but better than nothing. That's his plan, verse 20. So he got up and went to his father. Now, what happens next is something this guy could not have guessed in his wildest dreams. In an instant, everything changes. He goes from living and functioning as an orphan to a son. It says, while he was still a long way off, his father saw him, was filled with compassion for him, ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. So, right, even though his dad runs to him, and, and like as a dad with, with my girls, I like to call it like giving my kids like a super hug. A super hug. This dad runs, gives a super hug to his son, kisses him. The son still thinks that he blew it. He's waiting after the super hug for the super backhand. <laughs> that doesn't come. The son goes into the rehearsed speech, but his dad cuts him off mid-sentence. Verse 22, his father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger, sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate for this Son, for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. 
He was lost and is, and is found. So they began to celebrate. The father puts the best robe on his son, puts a ring on his finger, sandals on his feet, and they kill the fattened calf and have the party of the century. But if you know the story, not everyone's happy. There's the elder brother. We'll get to him in a bit. So again, that's a story from that church. You've heard it preached before. Now I'm going to start throwing some plot twists your way. And don't answer out loud, but here's to set it up the first key question. Who is the prodigal in the story? Okay, if you grew up going to church, maybe if you didn't go to church, um, it's, part of, it's part of our culture, this story. So you typically say, well, the son, the younger son. Many times, by the way, this is known as the parable of the prodigal son. But that's not the official title of this passage. It's based on tradition. And I believe that the parable of the prodigal son is not actually the best title of this passage. And I say that when you understand what the word prodigal means. We often think prodigal means partier or wayward. That's not actually accurate. Here are twin definitions of what prodigal means. Prodigal means recklessly extravagant. It means having spent everything. So in the parable, yes, you could say the younger son was a prodigal by the second definition because he spent everything he was given. But there's another character in the story who is also a prodigal. And I believe actually that this parable is more about this other character than it is about the younger son. Here's what Tim Keller wrote in his book titled, The Prodigal God. He says the word prodigal does not mean wayward, but recklessly spendthrift. It means to spend until you have nothing left. This term is therefore as appropriate for describing the father in the story as his younger son. That leads to the first plot twist I wanted to share. The father is a prodigal father. And this plot twist gets even twistier when we realize why Jesus told this parable and who the father represents. Tim Keller continues, he said, Jesus is showing us the God of great expenditure who is nothing if not prodigal toward us, his children. God's reckless grace is our greatest hope. It's a life-changing experience. See, when Jesus told the story, he wasn't thinking about some random dad. He was thinking of his father, of God the Father. So the father in that parable can be seen as God the Father. And God the Father is a prodigal father. He is recklessly extravagant. He spends everything. He pours out blessing. He provides like no other. This was a father, right, who ran to his son, which would have shocked the original audience because men in the culture didn't do that. He was a father who poured out affection on his son by kissing him. He was a father who poured out his grace not even allowing the son to say the whole rehearsed speech about wanting to become a servant. He was a father who wanted his son to have not the robe in the back of the closet, but the best robe. He was a father who put a ring on his son's finger, which means, believe it or not, he gave his son authority, his authority. That's what a ring meant. 
He was a father who put shoes on his feet. And this dad, when he had a party, didn't just order a stack of hot and ready pizzas. He had the fattened calf killed and cooked. And they had a feast. And they partied. And that father is a picture of our God. Need to believe that. So that's how Jesus tells the story. Now I'd like to add a plot twist to it, a second one. Every once in a while when I preach, I like to give a what-if scenario. Where we, we look at the text as, it, as the story happened and say, okay, but what if it happened differently? And I would love for each of you to enter into the story, young and old. Enter into the story. Use your imagination. And I want you to imagine you're the younger son. As I've shared in this series, the Bible teaches if you accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, you have the right to become a child of God. Which means the creator of the universe is your papa. Your daddy. Your abba. But many times, we live more like spiritual orphans than as sons and daughters. And the reason we live more like orphans is we battle. It's a battle. A battle against an orphan spirit or an orphan heart. Two ways of saying the same thing. Healing against this orphan spirit or orphan heart can only be found in the Father's house with intimacy with the Father. And so we need to learn to find our way home. So how do we live in 24-7 intimacy with our papa? So let's say during this series, you're in the series, or the Orphan Spirit series, and over the past few weeks, you start to feel hope. Hope that things can be different for you. Hope that how you lived isn't how you're going to have to live. Hope that what the Bible says about you is true, really is true. And you can live out your identity in Christ. Jesus said he came to give you lives to the full, and he actually meant it. Imagine that. The word to live a life worthy of the calling we've received, and it's a high calling. Because we're princes and princesses of the king. Come on. So now with that in mind, I'd like to add a plot twist. This is a what-if scenario. Now in the actual version of the story, the elder brother kind of takes his wrath out on his dad. Here's what the text says. Verse 25. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry, refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you, never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him? So in the story, as the parable is told by Jesus, the elder brother sets his sights on the dad and has this just vile conversation, spewing garbage towards the dad. But here's the what if. Again, you're in the story. You're the younger brother. What if the elder brother 
What if he set his sights on you directly? So imagine, while you're a long way off from home, and you begin your journey on the way home, what if the elder brother saw you first, before the father did? Here's plot twist number two. What if the elder brother got to you first? What if the elder brother got to you first? So on the way back home in this version of the story, before the father sees us, the elder brother sees us first. And we encounter the elder brother first. And the elder brother tells us, gives us an earful. And all of the things that are our greatest fears, the elder brother confirms. He tells us how we have broken the father's heart, how he's disappointed with us. The elder brother tells us just how angry the father is with us, how hurt he is. The elder brother tells us, you don't have what it takes. You'll never mount to anything. You'll never change. What do you struggle with today is what you'll struggle with the rest of your life. The elder brother starts to remind you of all the things that bring you shame, of all the things that make you feel condemned. He starts to lob accusation after accusation after accusation towards you. Tons of judgment, no love. And if the elder brother strikes the right nerve, we'll give up on our journey home, on our way to embrace our true identity. And we'll embrace his lies as truth. And we'll settle for living in the bunkhouse, the migrant shack where the servants live, where you don't have a real relationship intimate relationship with our Father, where we live much less than lives to the full. Here's the truth. I pray you hear this. God did not create you just to be a servant. After all, after all, after all, he already had legions of those. They're called angels. When God created you, he created you to be in intimate relationship as a son, as a daughter, as a prince, as a princess. He created you with a purpose. He created you to love you, to pour out his love over you believe it or not, to dance over you, to rejoice over you with singing. Man, Man this hit me. Last night we were watching a family video and it was, man, from six, seven years ago. It was my birthday and I was out of town. I came back home. And when I came home, the girls, I don't know, they were three, five, and seven. Faith's now 13, play keyboard today. So I came home, and the girls, so this is, again, we're watching this on our family video. It's so thankful we have these DVDs because I would not have uh, remembered this. They're all dressed up in their little princess dresses to celebrate me. (laughs) 
and they made these carnival games in the backyard. Our, <laughs> our awning just like tore off of our house. And so it was like hanging off of the, but I'm like, let's just have a party. I hate doing projects anyway. So we had like this bowling game that they invented and then this hula hoop game and this like egg toss game. And I came home and they threw me a party just to celebrate me. And I watched this video yesterday and I just had this just moment just hit me just like this. I'm saying, man, Like God made, like he wants to celebrate you. He wants you to see you the way he sees you. I know, right? It's like this. As a parent, if you could see yourself the way your kids see you, be Superman, right? We see ourselves, we see all the times we fail, Mommy guilt, you know, all that. Daddy struggled with guilt too. We need to see ourselves the way God sees us. God rejoices over us with singing. You need to believe it. I have no idea where I was with my sermon notes here. <laughs> Come on, let's find it. Doesn't really matter, does it? Prodigal son, that's <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. See, we need to reject bunkhouse thinking and embrace our true identity and think of ourselves the way God thinks of us as his child. And so here's a key question. Who's the elder brother? in your story? Who has functioned as an elder brother in your life? There's probably a bunch of them, unfortunately. Who has told you lies? That you've embraced as truth? That have derailed you? That have kept you from living the life God is inviting you to? That have kept you from seeing yourself the way God wants you to see you? Unfortunately, sometimes you're the elder brother for you. Sometimes it's your, your voice. Sometimes it's the voice of the accuser that masquerades and plants seeds and lobs bombs. Sometimes the devil, who is known as the accuser of the brethren, uses loved ones as puppets. You've all been there. Where somebody says something that loves you and it's like like a smart bomb. Like strategically designed just to just to get you. And they might not even realize what they're saying. They might not even realize how much that hurts. But it's a lie that's trying to lodge its way into your soul and derail you. I want to share just a few examples of some of the elder brothers in my life. I'm not going to name names or show pictures. <laughs> like, here's the top 10 people that are, you know, not, it's not that. I speak in general terms. <laughs> but over the last 20 years, say going going back to 1998, I felt this calling to quit my job as an engineer and to go to seminary to study to become a pastor. I felt very clearly God was calling me to do that. I knew he was, but then some elder brothers showed up and told me it wasn't a good idea, that I shouldn't do it. I was too young in my faith. There was a knee-jerk reaction. I really wasn't thinking it through and just tried to derail me. Thankfully, I 
didn't listen to those voices or I would have quit this journey before I took my first step. So I push through all those elder brother voices. I get to seminary out in California. And then there's a whole other set of elder brothers. Some of them are my voices. Where I begin to hear over and over again, you don't have what it takes. You, a pastor? You'll never be a pastor. Who do you think you are? Ever heard that voice? And that oftentimes is a very private battle. I graduate from seminary just after 9-11 happened. The economy is in the tank. No churches are hiring. The elder brother shows up again. Convinces me I will never work at a church. Never get hired. I'm going to go back to maybe be able to get an engineering job. That I just wasted the past three years of my life going to seminary for a useless degree. Fast forward some more. Back in 2010, Kelly and I, Kelly and I feel called by God to plant this church. And a bunch of elder brothers got out their megaphones and basically told me, you're not a leader. If you plant a church, It'll fail within the first 90 days. Place your bets. You don't have the right spiritual gifts to lead. You don't have the right strengths to pastor. You don't have what it takes. Ever hear those voices? And every time someone said something along those lines... Directly, indirectly, the devil just throws gasoline on the fire. There's a phrase that children say in playgrounds. You have to help me end it. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. (laughs) That is such a lie. Oh my goodness, you kidding me? I remember saying that on the playground. And then someone said, my stick is still different. And I would say it, and the words would hurt. But I'd say that cliche anyway. That's a complete lie. Words hurt. They're lies wanting to lodge into your soul and wound you. And you have to, you, we, are, we are called overcomers. Embrace our identity, church. So who is... Who, is an old, who are the elder brothers? What are those voices and what did they say? And to make it very current, here's the next version of that question. Who has functioned as the elder brother during this sermon series? Like right now. Where you've heard this series, Orphan Spirit, and you, you're like, okay, I need to live out my identity in Christ. You start to feel hope and then accusation starts coming challenge to that identity the invitation to stay stuck what's happening right now and I pray that all those voices all those elder brothers are drowned out by the voice of the Lord here's your action step it's embrace your identity as an overcomer it's a choice embrace your identity as an overcomer. And the way we do that is the way Jesus did it when he was tempted by the devil. Scripture. I want to read some scriptures that are true, true of who Jesus is and because of him, what is true about us. This is a part of our identity we need to believe and we need to walk in. So if you want, maybe you want to close your eyes. Maybe you want to just, however, just engage with these scriptures. I pray you hear them.
John 16, 33, Jesus said, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In the world you, have, you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. 1 John 4, 4. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them. Because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. John continues, he says, for everyone who's been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world. Our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Romans 8, 37. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Last but not least, in the revelation of John, then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren who accuses them before our God day and night has been cast down and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. Amen. I, I pray you hear this. That you are not what the elder brother says is true. You are not defined by your past. You are not defined by the accusations of the enemy. You are not defined by what that bully said on the playground. You are not defined by what maybe a sibling said in their worst moments. Or what maybe your parents said in their worst moments. You are not what anyone says you are. You are who the prodigal God says you are. And you know what the prodigal God says you are? He says, you are an overcomer. You are an overcomer. I pray, church, preach to myself, so I'm preaching that to you, that we would live out this key aspect of our identity. Who am I looking at right now? A bunch of overcomers. Amen. By the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Proclaim it. Amen? Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. All right, so we're going to spend some time